ready to worship in this room? right now, Lord, that we can just freely worship. Come on, just begin to thank Him. God, we just thank You that we have this freedom to just be able to worship, Lord. God, we're excited about You today. God, we don't care what it might look like or how crazy we might look. God, we're excited to praise You. 
God, we are excited to worship you. God, you are worthy of being excited about Father God. You're so worthy of that. God, more than we could ever give. God, you are worthy, Lord. God, we welcome your presence in this room. We are here for you. Nothing else matters in this moment, Father, but you. God, our focus is on you. Come on, just begin to close your eyes. Just focus on him. No distractions. We prayed during our practice time this morning that there would be no distractions in this place. God, our focus is on you. Thank you, Lord. in the crushing.
heart's cry. So make me, make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing. The all you have given me. Jesus, be new wine out of me. So that can make me. So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. And Jesus, For a couple minutes, let's just begin to sing the song that's on our heart. It doesn't have to be something on the screen or or a song we've all heard. There's something I think on each of our hearts. Maybe it's just a thank you. God, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege of worship. Thank you for new wine today. We thank you that you bring beauty from ashes. Thank you that something beautiful is coming from the chaos. Oh, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. Come on, let's begin to praise him. Maybe you feel like you're in a season of the crushing, and you're just asking him what the song says for this new wine that can only come after the, the crushing and the pressing. God, we just thank you, Lord, for new seasons coming. Let's go to that place of just you and him. Maybe your eyes closed. Maybe you want to kneel down. Whatever it is, let's just go to that next level. God, we surrender to you. We yield to you, God. We trust in you, God. You are trustworthy, God. You can be trusted, Father. You can be trusted, Father.
And we're going to keep declaring what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Come on, how many know there's something so special that happens when we sing that? So we're going to sing it just a few more times. Sing it over your life. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. reminds me I was I was leading worship um, it's probably been a couple of years ago maybe more than that um, and out of the corner of my eye as I was leading and this doesn't typically happen to me but as I was leading out of the corner of my eye um, I saw something and it was like it was running the other way and for a second in the natural I was kind of just like what is going on? Like, am I seeing things? Is somebody, is everybody okay? What's going on? And I kind of looked at that area and I felt God just tell me that as you worship, not just me, but as we worship, that the demons, they run and flee. <laughs> and I could see it almost even in the natural. He allowed me to have, I believe, this vision because we always say that, right? But I kind of was able to really kind of witness something just took off running. And I was like, this is just so crazy. And so every time I lead worship now, I think about that moment. And I think that sometimes, I think maybe, especially when we're maybe used to going to church, I hate to use that phrase, but we're used to going to church. Maybe we were raised in church. This portion of the service, right? I don't want to just say worship because it's all worship, but this portion of the worship service, it kind of just seems like maybe it's just kind of getting us ready, right? We're getting ready for the rest of the service. And I think that God used that moment to show me that what we do in this portion of the service is so important and it matters and it's not because I'm up here but it's because God is in the room that his presence is here and when his presence is here there is freedom and the enemy he can't stand freedom and the demons they can't survive in freedom so they take off running in the name of Jesus because his name it carries this freedom and they know it they know it and they're scared of it so as we declare his name today we don't have to think that maybe those chains are going to keep hanging on. Maybe those demons are going to keep hanging on. We know they cannot survive when God's people truly walk in freedom. They have to leave. They cannot stay because they cannot survive in this atmosphere of freedom. And so it's such a special time that we get to have. We get this privilege of worship. And so, God, right now, we just thank you for that. God, we thank you, Lord, that you show us those visions, that you show us these things that um, sometimes in the natural, sometimes just in different ways, God, that, that really truly show that your word is true. God, that when we speak the name Jesus, that the enemy runs and, and has to flee and cannot stay anymore. That when we speak the name of Jesus, that cancer has to go, that anxiety has to go, depression has to go. That when we say the name Jesus, everything else that doesn't line up with your word, it has to go right now. And so I just declare that, I prophesy that right now over this congregation, that anything in our minds, and our bodies, and our hearts that doesn't line up with you, Father, has to leave. God, we just thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your protection, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him praise like you know that his name is important and matters. Amen, amen. And you can go ahead and be seated. Check out the screen. Good morning.
morning, welcome to Maranatha Christian Center. And if you're watching online, we are so excited that you've joined us here today as well. It's already been a great morning, but we are just getting started. Before we continue with the rest of our service, we wanna let you know what's going on here at MCC. Merge and Fuse students, don't forget your pastors are hosting a potluck Friendsgiving just for you tonight from 6 to 7.30. So bring your friends and your favorite Thanksgiving dish and meet us in the Merge room. That's it for today's announcements. If you'd like more information on anything you've heard today, you can visit our website or email info at maranathadecab.org. And don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to our monthly newsletter. If you'd like to give your tithes and offerings, we have two boxes at the front, one at the back, and an iPad station if you'd like to give online. Now, take a minute to say hi to someone next to you. Bring your tithes, and you can also take your kids ages birth to eighth grade to their MCC classes now. We'll be back in just a few minutes with an exciting message from our pastor.
when God's mercy is poured out upon it means I don't get what I deserve. I'm so thankful God doesn't deal with us based on what we deserve. And, uh, you know, grace is just the other side. It means he does give us what we don't deserve. So we get both ends of the coin, uh, both ends of the stick on that one, both sides of the coin means we don't get what we do deserve, but we get what we don't deserve. We get the blessings of God. I've, we were singing the song a moment ago, and it talked about one of the phrases that was under an open heaven, talking about that. You know, uh, we live in, in the special time of, but, you know, God's seasons and God's blessings are for all times. All times. And I, lo I love the scripture that talks about, says, bring all the tithes in the storehouse or maybe meet on my table and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven. That's an open heaven, isn't it? To supply all your need and all the things that you have need of. And God is so faithful to do that. I'm thankful to be here this morning. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and you remembered to give thanks for all that you partook of. And it was good, wasn't it? It's a good time. If you're joining us online today, we want to say a special thank you for that. We always appreciate those who join us uh, on our live stream. This morning, if you would, turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to read the first four verses, and then we're going to skip down and read a couple more verses, chapter, uh, verses 12 and 13. And then a little bit later, we're going to read uh, Psalms 139, a few verses out of there. So, in John chapter 1, John starts off a little different than the rest of the Gospels. John starts off like Genesis, in the beginning. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Born by the will of God. That's exciting, isn't it? You know, this time of year, we begin to turn our, our minds toward other things. We just finished Thanksgiving, as we said. I want to ask a serious question. You can be honest with me, okay? This is true confession time. How many of you might have eaten a little bit too much? Good, good. All right. I'm glad. Okay, how many have said you're going to slack off now till Christmas and they do it again? All right. That's good. <laughs> Well, I might have eaten a little bit too much, too. I'm not sure, but I think I might have. You know, we all have important things we have to get done, and, you know, we're starting to get ready for the Christmas season. It's, it's funny that two of the biggest holidays of the whole year come only a month apart. You should spread them out a little bit, you know, so that we have time to get over the one before we come to the next one. You know, I understand and people say that there's more weight gain this time of year than any other time. We're moving into a time of less activity and a lot more food. So, uh, but we, we, it's a busy time of the year. And in this busyness, we need to be sure that we take care of business. You know, we don't let our busyness hinder our number one business and this important that we think about what these seasons represent. One of the most important things that I'm gonna share with you this morning is about developing your personal and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Developing your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not just talking about getting saved. I'm, I'm assuming that in the congregation that most people have already been born again. If you have not, you need to be. That's just all there is to it. There's only two kinds of people in the world. It's not rich or poor, it's not black or white, it's not, uh, Foreign or internet, it's not that. It's saved and lost. There's only two kinds. And you either are born again or you're not. If you are, your destination is heaven. If you're not, it's at you know where. Separated from God for eternity. So the Bible says that it's given that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ. And that's what God wants us to do. So today, but I'm not talking specifically about, uh, to, about being saved. If you're not, you need to be. But I'm talking about as, us as believers, how we need to continue on with the Christian life. How we need to continue on something that's very, very important. And it's developing our personal relationship, our growing relationship with Jesus. This is the question for today. Why should you get to know your creator? Why? Why should we get to know him? I mean, isn't it enough to say, well, he created us, and so therefore, since we have been created, we're alive, and so therefore, we just kind of go on about life and have a jolly good time. Is there a valid reason to really want to get to know our creator? We just read a moment ago, and it says that, that uh, he was before all things and he created all things. 
So today, we're talking about how to get to know Jesus better. A developing relationship. I can assure you right now, you do not know the fullness of God. Remember when I say God, I'm talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is one. There's three parts, but one God, three persons, excuse me, one God. So how do we get to know our Creator better? And what are the advantages of knowing our Creator and getting to know Him better? I'm going to give you four very important reasons to get to know Jesus better. Four reasons. Are you ready for these? First of all, Jesus made you. Jesus is your Creator. Now we say, well, you know, God created all things and God did. The Bible says that Jesus was there at creation and by him all things were made. Nothing was made except by him. He made you. He knows you. Before all things else existed, there was Christ with God. And he has always been alive and is himself God. He created everything there is, it says in the uh, living Bible. Nothing exists that he didn't make. Eternal life is in him, and this life gives light to all mankind. Think about that. You have the opportunity not to just meet the creator of the universe, not the opportunity just to know who he is. You have the opportunity to meet your creator. Yes, he did create the universe, but he created you. You think, no, it didn't. My mom and dad created me. <laughs> well, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, that's the truth, but still, he is the one who created you. I said we're going to read another verse a little bit later, and this is it right here. You know, you've heard the saying, when in doubt, consult the owner's manual. When in doubt, look at the manual. And I, I find out, I, I explore all possibilities, and when I can't do anything, I say, I guess I better uh, either consult the owner's manual or say, hey, Siri, how do you do this, you know? I'm glad I don't have it with me now. She'll be talking to me. Yeah, you know, do you do that? Do you just explore all possibilities when you find that there's no way I can do this? Then you create or you look at the owner's manual and say, oh, that was so simple. I wish I'd look at this first. That seems to be what we do with life. We, we create, we explore all avenues. We go every direction. We put so many different things in our lives trying to find real meaning, real truth, real understanding, having a fulfilled life. And then finally one day we give up in a heap somewhere and we say, maybe I should consult the manual. And you know, the Bible is God's manual for living on planet earth. That's his manual. So we want to uh, consult the manual. And uh, knowing Jesus is even better than consulting the manual because we don't just have to read the book. We can know the creator and he can instruct us and teach us. When in doubt, consult the manual. Yeah, but knowing Jesus is better. So if you want to know how to get the most out of life, why not be, go to the one who created you and who created life. In the beginning, he was here and he, he created all life. He understands life. So we're going to talk about that. Now, he already knows you and he wants you to know him. You say, Jesus already knows me? Think about this. If he created all things and he did, he knows you because you are a created being. And even though your mom and dad had the, the privilege of putting you to, to start the process, he oversaw the process. Listen to what it says in Psalms 139, the Psalm of David in his prayer. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And your eyes saw my substance before uh, being yet unformed and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned before me when as yet there were none of them. He knew before you ever got here that you were coming. He oversaw your creation, and he not only did that, he laid out a plan for your life. It's so easy and so simple when you look at things from the biblical point of view to see why there's so much confusion in this world. There's so much lostness in this world. There's so many people wandering around aimlessly trying to find meaning to life because they're trying to find meaning in life apart from life. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the life. There's no life apart from Jesus Christ. So it's very important to know our creator, to get to know him. We have the opportunity to know him, and it's so important that we do so. Secondly, Jesus gives you meaning to life. He gives you meaning to life. Not only do we, he, he, did he create us, but now he also gives us meaning to life. 
what is life really all about? Well, you say, well, we're born, you know, we grow a little bit, and then we go to school, and then we uh, grow a little more, then we work, and we make money, we save a little, get married, have kids, grandkids, get old and die. That's kind of what life is. Is that really what life is? That it's the progression that goes through life, but is that the, what life is consisting of? Just get born, grow a little bit, go to school, grow a little bit more, get out of school, go to work, get in debt, get married, have kids, grandkids, and then one day you die and everything's all done. No, that's not what life's about. There's so much more to life than that. And I, I, have you ever asked the question, you know, is that all there is to life? No, it's not, is it? That's not all there is to life. The Bible opened up a whole new revelation of what life is. The Bible answers all the questions that we have about life, about who, what, why, where, when, and how. The questions that society is asking but can't get the correct answer to. They're asking the right question, but they're not getting the right answers. They're going to the wrong source. They're going to the source of darkness to get the answer for light. And you can't find light in darkness. The Bible says the world was dark, but Jesus was the light that came and the light illuminated the darkness. But you don't go to the darkness to find the light. You go to the light. He is the light. He answers, he, he exposes and opens up all things to us. Your, a relationship with Jesus Christ opens up our life to enjoy purpose, peace, and power. A relationship with Jesus Christ secures your place in heaven, but it does more than that. It also settles your life on this earth. Your life feel unsettled? You feel like I'm just kind of existing, going through the motions, but I don't really... See, I'm not talking about just getting saved. I'm talking about a vital relationship with the one who created you, the one who knows all the ins and outs of life, the one who never has known anything but life because that's who he is. He is life. Let me tell you, man was never created to exist. <clears throat> most of the world is existing because most of the world does not know Jesus Christ. And much of the world who does know Jesus Christ is still just existing because they've never really gotten to know him in a personal, intimate way. They may know them as their savior, but they don't know him as their day-by-day -day companion, their Lord, their boss, their master, who they've committed their lives to. They've never come to the place where they've said, my life is not my life, it's your life. I want to give my life to you. I want to know you personally, to know him in a personal relationship. Man was never created to exist. Man was created to coexist in a vital union with God, his creator. God said, and it's recorded in Revelation, I mean, uh, in Genesis, it's recorded, let us make man in our image and we will have fellowship with him. Fellowship. With Adam and Eve had unhindered fellowship with God for a while. But you know what? When Adam and Eve sinned, when they blew it, when they disobeyed God, they knew immediately something happened. They knew that, that ex they were just now existing. And they began to do things self-effort-wise. Let's go cover ourselves because we're naked. Let's hide from God, but we do not want him. We, want, we do not feel like we can exist and coexist with God, so they just started existing, deciding for themselves what was right and wrong. And ever since that time, man is born in a relationship with the world that says you're just going to exist until you come to know your Savior. And once you know your Savior, then you can coexist with him and with the Father again. Adam and Eve knew immediately something was terribly wrong. God created man in his image to have a relationship with him and fellowship with him. He wanted to have a relationship to man and fellowship with man. But man broke it. God's promises of life and purpose and peace and power to all who know him. Do you have that today? Do you know your creator in such a way that you have his purposes, his, his power, his peace in your heart? Is there turmoil in your life? Is there confusion in your life? Now, I'm not saying life doesn't get confusing because it does. But I'm saying that even in the midst of confusion, we're living in a pretty confused world right now. But in the midst of that confusion, we can have a direction and a director who directs us, who guides us and leads us. He not only gives life eternal, but he also gives life abundant. We know John 10, 10 is one of our favorite quoted scriptures. Jesus said, I came not only to give you life, but to give you that more abundantly, more abundantly. 
He doesn't want our life to be just, and, and I'm not talking about just financial blessings and health blessings. I'm talking about a full and rich relationship where we are at one with our creator. Our minds are at peace. You can have all the, all the physical blessings, all the material blessings you want and still be terribly confused. It's not just the poor people that take their own lives. It's the rich and wealthy who take their lives because they give all their life to find things and they get all these things and they gather them together and realize it doesn't mean anything. I'm still not satisfied. That's why we got to have a better relationship and grow closer to know our creator. Apart from God, there is no meaning to life. Life has no rhyme. Life has no reason. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God's got a plan for you and he's got a future for you. He's got a hope that he wants to instill in you right now. Like I said, you may be going through hard times, but in the midst of those hard times, the hope that he places in our lives can give us peace and contentment. That's why it's important to get to know him because once we get to know him, we know we can trust him. And once we trust him, then we give ourselves to him completely and he directs our paths. He leads us in the way he wants us to go and he gives our life meaning and fullness. Do you feel like your life's counting for something? Do you feel like your life's meaning anything? He gives you a future and a hope. <clears throat> Knowing Jesus in a personal way changes everything about life. Unfortunately, most of us live in a tiny, insignificant way because we've filled our lives with meaningless activity. We've tried to make a meaning out of life by more activity. I just need to do more. If I just make more money, if I just get more fame, if I just get more fortune, if I can just buy more land, if I can do it, that'll give me meaning to life. But you do that and you look back and you say, that didn't do it. I went through a time like that in my life. I don't have time to go into all the details, but there was a time in my life where I had certain goals and aspirations. And I thought if I could just attain these goals and these aspirations, then my life won't be empty. It'll be full. I had everything going for me that I needed, but I was empty. I attained the goals, I attained the aspirations, and before I even turned around, I said, is that all there is to it? You see, meaning in life doesn't come from accomplishment. It doesn't come from accolades. It doesn't come from riches. It doesn't come from possessions. It comes from a personal relationship with a God who created you. And I'm talking about a vital personal relationship, not a long distance relationship. A relationship where he becomes more real to you than your spouse or your children or your grandchildren. He becomes more real to you than anyone. He's there. In the middle of the night, you wake up. His presence is there with you. You recognize, you know, you honor his presence. In the day, as you're going through the day, he gives you these little nods, these little winks, these little bumps, and he says, I'm with you. Speaks a little something into your spirit, and you say, God, thank you for that. I'm talking about a relationship where you're riding down the road by yourself in the car. Maybe you got the radio going, maybe you don't. And all of a sudden, God just says, I'm here with you, riding with you. I've got this. Just do what I say, live like I say, be what I say, and you'll have the most fulfilled life you can ever have. He says, I'm with you. I'm in this. I've got this. Yes, our lives are filled with so much meaningless activity. I want to, I, I want us all to think about this a moment. Let's go a little deeper than think about it. Let's ponder it. If you ponder something, that's like thinking to three times level, you know. Let's ponder this thought. How about this? Am I doing anything right now that will have any eternal reward? What am I doing that will have eternal consequence? Am I doing anything that will last forever or is everything I'm doing going to be gone when I'm gone? Is there anything that I'm going to lay up over on the other side? Are all of my efforts and energies being spent on temporal things? You know, we need to ask ourselves these questions because we all one day are going to pass from this earth. Are we sending anything over? Are we doing anything that's going to have eternal reward, eternal consequences? You know, as Christmas approaches, and it'll be here before you know it. How many got your Christmas shopping done already? I know some of you do because I've been seeing some of you. You got some of it done? How many have already got their tree up? All right. You know, that's the, that's the day after Thanksgiving. That's when our tree goes up. It just as fast as we can get it after Thanksgiving. 
And some people put their trees up before Thanksgiving. That's okay. How many put your trees up before Thanksgiving? You like to get after it, don't you? Yeah. And I think it's really sad that we spend, we, we, we put those trees that were so pretty, and then they last for just a few weeks, then we had to take them back down. I don't like to take Christmas tree down, but it's just not the same after Christmas, is it? Some reason before Christmas, it's all exciting, but after Christmas, it's just standing over there in the corner with the lights on it, you know. It's still pretty, but it doesn't have the same meaning. Isn't it, isn't it strange how something that so much meaning can be, and then all of a sudden it just drops off? I remember as a kid, man, my saddest day was the day after Christmas because I'd been looking forward to it for months since last Christmas. I'd been thinking, oh, I can't wait till next Christmas. Well, all the fun things to do, and then it's over, and there's like, oh, it's over. And as we're thinking about Christmas, we're moving toward the Christmas season, think about this, and think about doing something that has eternal value. Think about that. Going all the way back, to when Jesus was born. Mary and Joseph were going to Jerusalem. Jesus was gonna be born there. They went to the innkeeper and he said, I'm sorry, I have no place. There's no room in my inn. Think about that. His actions didn't keep Jesus from being born. His actions didn't stop God's purpose or history. He just missed the privilege of housing the birth of the Savior. He sent him to a stall instead of housing him in his own home. What about our lives? Are we giving a place to Jesus in our lives? Or are we just sending him off? So you can stay in my backyard if you want to. You know, doing that's not going to hinder God's will being done. Doing that's not going to keep God from getting the glory for the things he does. It just keeps us missing out on what he's doing. It just keeps us from getting in on what God's up to. Are you in on what God's up to in your life? You say, I don't even know if God's up to anything. Well, find out. Well, how do I find out? You simply go to God and spend some time in prayer and say, God, I just want to give you my life. I want you to, I know, Jesus, you're my Savior, but I want to know you more. I want to get to know you in a way so that I I hear your voice. And I don't say, I wonder if that's God or if that's just the bologna I ate last night acting up. I want to know when God speaks. I've said it, I bet you have too. I don't know if this was God or me or maybe even the devil. One way to tell if it's, if it's the devil, if it's something bad, it's the devil. If it's something good, it's not the devil. God doesn't tell you to do good things, does he? He tells you to do bad things, doesn't he? But sometimes I think, well, was that me or was that God? It's so important to, when we get to know him, we recognize his voice. Because the Bible says it very clearly, my sheep hear my voice. And they recognize my voice, the voice of the stranger they do not hear. Those people who go around all the time talking about what the devil told them, I think, I thought you were saved. The Bible says you don't hear him, you hear Jesus. They hear the devil easily. We should be able to be in tune with our creator. We should be able to tune. If I need to, if I need to answer a question, I should be able to say, God, what, what do I need to do in this? And he tells me. I can't tell you how many times we would have made wrong turns if we hadn't heard God say, this is the way, walk in it. You learn to trust the voice of God and the way of God, and it leads you in the right direction and the right way. Maybe you're making some decisions right now. You've got some really big decisions to make, and I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but there's some of you do. I know you are. You're going through it. I feel it very strongly. You're making some very, very, maybe life-changing decisions, and you're trying to say, I don't know what to do. If I do this, 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 it'll work out. But this over here, I can do this. Maybe this. Which is the best? I don't understand. So they got pros and cons. Don't worry about it. There's only one question you need to ask. God, what do you want me to do? He's not playing games with you. He doesn't put his will on a, on a stick like a carrot out in front of a donkey and make you chase it after and never can catch it. He wants you to find his will. But you see, the reason we don't know his will because we don't know him well enough to hear, recognize his voice when he speaks to us. Or maybe we don't even know that we're supposed to ask him. Maybe you grew up thinking, you know, the best way to do is get saved, go to heaven, but God said in the corner, I'll let you know if I need anything from you. Many people were raised that way. God just kind of, he's always there, but he's not, he, you know, he's just kind of uh, uh, the second in command sitting back there not really involved in anything. Maybe you need to just today say, God, I want to tell you something right now. You are the president. You're the head. You're the CEO. You're everything. I'm nothing. You lead this life. It's yours. 
I want to know you more personally. I want to hear your voice. I want to be still in your presence so I can hear your still small voice so I won't make wrong decisions. Man, people, so many people have been hurt. So many people have been discouraged. So many people have been messed up because somebody made a wrong decision because they didn't hear what God said. I can tell you this, what God says is always right. It's never wrong. He's never said, uh-oh. That's kind of supposed to be funny. <laughs> that wasn't funny to you? It's funny to me because I'm so glad he didn't look at me and say, uh-oh, look what I created. Oh, man, how did, I, how, how did he get here? No, yeah, he looks at me and says, you're just what I wanted. He looks at you and he says, you're just what I want. And, and, and when you obey his voice, you're just where I want you to be. You know, you would have thought God would say, uh-oh, when he put the children of Israel out in the front of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was coming and they were going to kill every one of them. And God said, uh-oh, what did I do? I messed up. No, he didn't. He said, Moses, show them the deliverance of your Savior. Show them how God works. Moses held out the rod and the way opened up through the sea. And the children of Israel didn't die. The enemy died. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to show you the way through the wilderness. He wants you to know him in such a way that you'll trust him. And when he says, hold the stick up, you say, don't make good sense, but I'm going to do it anyway. He's able to back up everything he says. If he tells you something, get involved in what he's saying. Do it. If you don't take time to get to know Jesus, you miss the opportunity to know your creator. And I'm not talking about a long-distance relationship. I'm talking about FaceTime. Close, together, moment by moment. You miss the opportunity to know your creator. You miss the opportunity to have the purpose, peace, and power that only Jesus can give you through a relationship with him. If you don't make room for him in your life, you miss his purpose for your life. Oh, by the way, you only get one shot at this. You either do it right this time or you don't do it. You understand that? Some think, well, if I don't do it right, that's okay. I'll, I'll come back around another time. Look, life is not like the movie Groundhog Day. I know that's an old, old movie. But probably most people have seen it once. Anyway, let me explain to you. Groundhog Day, the guy messed up all the, he was a mess up. And every morning the alarm would ring and he would wake up and he would go a little further doing good and then he'd mess up again. And then the next day the alarm would ring, he'd live the whole day over. And finally he did it till he got the whole day right. You don't get to start over. You don't get to, you don't get to start and have another life. This is your only life. You either do it right this time or it's over. You don't get to come back and say, well, you know, my, other, my next life I'll accept Jesus as my Savior and I'll get to know my Creator. No, you do it all right now. What we do is in, in this life, and then we face our creator. Then we go to be with him. You don't get to keep starting over till you get it right. But you can continue in this life if you'll just say, God, I messed up last week, but I want to start right this week. He can start you there. You only get one life, but you get a lot of chances in this one life to do it right. And today is an opportunity for you to say, you know what? I've been messing it up. I've been doing my own thing. God, I want what you want for my life. I've got decisions that, change, that affect me, affect my family, affect my kids, affect my grandkids. I want to do it right. Thirdly, Jesus knows all there is about life. Remember it says he was here in the beginning and he was life. In him was the light of man. He was life. He knows life. He was here. He put it all together. He knows exactly how it all works. He will always be. He knows the end from the beginning. By the way, he knows what your tomorrow is going to bring today. And he wants to lead you and direct you so you'll be prepared for your tomorrow. I love Psalm 32. It says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And when you first read that, it doesn't make much sense. Just kind of, well, that's cool. He'll guide me with his eye. But then you think about that and you think, his eye, he sees everything. I will guide you to where you need to be tomorrow, next week, six weeks, next year. And I will guide you so that you'll be where you need to be when you need to be there. He says, I have a plan for you. I have an expected end and I'll lead you to that place. Jeremiah 29, 11. Can you imagine knowing that there's no way you can fail? 
When you put your, not just your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior, but you say, Jesus, I want to get to know you intimately. I want you to be my guide. I want to just give my life to you. You guide me. You tell me when to turn right, when to turn left. You tell me what to buy, what not to buy. You tell me when to invest, when not to invest. I'm telling you, he's involved in your life in a personal way. And he wants to guide you. He knows the end from the beginning. Nothing catches him by surprise, as I said a moment ago. Whatever you're facing, I want you to know this. Jesus has been there. You think, well, Jesus doesn't know what I'm going through. Oh, yes, he does. Remember this. Jesus is God. He was God. In the beginning, he was there. He was God. There was a time of about 33 years where he put aside that and he became man. He wasn't man and God at the same time. He put aside. He became man. He acted and moved and lived and breathed on this earth as a man. He hungered. He thirsted. He thought. He acted. He reacted. He had feelings. He understands people because he's been here. He knows what you're going through, and he understands that, yes, there are fearful times in this life. He understands there are times in this life when we feel betrayed. He understands all those things that we've gone through. You name it, he has dealt with it, and he has overcome it. Rejection, no one was ever rejected more than Jesus was. His own people rejected him. Some of his own family rejected him. Not only did they just reject him, they rejected him to the point that they crucified him. That's, re that's rejection. So you're sitting there thinking, well, I, I didn't get accepted there. I feel rejection. He knows that. He understands that. Jesus understands disappointment. He was teaching and preaching, and the multitudes were following him, and they began to teach the real truth about the kingdom. He turned around and looked, and the multitudes were gone. He even turned to his disciples. He said, will you leave me too? Peter said, Peter was kind of bad to pop off, but he said a lot of good things. He said, Lord, where else could we go? Only you had the way of eternal life. Jesus knew rejection. One of his 12, not only, one of his 12 turned him in, betrayed him. One that he had spent three years with, betrayed him. He understands abandonment. He understands about being lied to. He understands about being lied about. They said, he's, he, they said he was blaspheming. They said he was uh, of the devil. They lied to him. They lied about it. He understands discouragement. He understands being abused. No one's ever been abused more than Jesus was. He was misused. He had anxiety. You got anxiety? Let me tell you. Have you ever sweat drops of blood? He understands anxiety. You say, how do you know he understands all that stuff? How do you know? Because Hebrews 4.15 says, we do not have a high priest who cannot, be, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted just like we are, yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. Maybe you feel betrayed. Maybe you feel hurt. Maybe you feel lied to. Maybe you feel used and abused. Maybe you have anxieties and fears. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He said, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Come pray with me because I really don't want to go do this. He said, Father, if there's any other way that this could happen, let's do it that way. Let's don't do it this way. I don't want to go to the cross. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. He was willing to face that and to go through that terrible pain and anxiety so that we could know him as our creator. The creator died for the creature. Isn't that something? So that he could know us again. Adam and Eve lost it in the garden. Jesus Christ gained it back. The Bible tells us in Romans that whatever Adam and Eve lost, Jesus gained back for us. Now we can walk in unhindered harmony and fellowship with God. He knows how you feel. He knows what you feel. He knows what makes you tick, and he knows what ticks you off. He knows you all too well sometimes, huh? And sometimes we try to fool him. Lord, uh, you know, I really didn't think that. I really didn't act that. <laughs> yeah, come on, let's just get honest. The great thing is he knows everything about you, but he still says, come into my throne room. I want to visit with you. I want to know you more. I want you to know me more. 
He knows you all the way through and through. Fourthly, the last thing, Jesus provides a great hereafter. He provides a great afterlife. I'll say it like this. Jesus has a wonderful retirement program. You know, some people have better retirement program than others on this earth, but he has the ultimate retirement program. He promised us eternal life, bliss, never a worry, never a problem. The greatest of all is we live unhindered in his presence, unhindered. Philippians chapter 3 says this, but what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, the goal to gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He gives us his righteousness. The greatest gain in this life is Christ. The greatest result is eternal life with Christ. Eternal life with Christ. Philippians chapter 3, 20 through 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven. We're on this earth, but our citizenship is in heaven. We're sojourners on this earth. We're, we're, we're spiritual beings going on a physical journey. Our citizenship is in heaven. For which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Our earthly minds, our earthly minds are so finite we cannot really conceive of what heaven's like. That's another reason to get to know our creator. We can't even begin to fathom the greatness, the glory, the splendor, the eternal peace that living in the unhindered presence of God, our creator, will be. He provides that for those who know him. You know, in this life, we all set priorities, don't we? We set priorities, right? I, I, I would dare say some of you have some priorities you've set even today. Uh, maybe you have a priority that oh, you're going to go eat lunch somewhere, we're going to do something after. Uh, we set priorities in life based on what we deem important. Doctors, set an appointment with a doctor. Dentists, set an appointment. Lawyers, sometimes we have to go see a lawyer. Counselors, and let's don't forget beauty shop appointments. We set those, don't we? Why? Because it's important. If you want to get somewhere and get some things done. You've got to have an appointment to go do it. We all set up priorities. Do you think if those are important enough to be a priority, do you think going, getting to know our creator should be one of our priority points in life? Shouldn't that be priority one? Just saying, God, I just want to know you. I want to understand you. I want, to, I want you to open up your ways to me. You see, there are levels of walking in the presence of God. The children of Israel walked with God through the wilderness. They went with God. They saw God work. They did all those things. And, and they were right there the same as Moses was. But the Bible says this. The children of Israel saw the acts of God. Moses knew the ways of God. Why did he know the ways of God? Because he made a priority. One time in his life, he said, I'm gonna go up on that mountain and I'm gonna see why that fire is burning up on that mountain. I'm, if there's a God up there, I'm gonna to get to know him. It's a priority. I want to, I, if he's real, I wanna see him. And they said, you can't go up there, you can't go up there. He said, look, if there's a God up there and he is God, then I can go up there because I believe I can know him. The Bible tells that Moses walked with God in ways that men never have before walked with him. He went into the tent and the presence of God itself came in there with him. And he sat face to face and talked to God. That was Old Testament. That was unheard of. We're living in a new dispensation called the New Testament, the age of grace when we don't have to go to some tabernacle to meet with God. The Bible says now that we are in this age, we're in the church age, that we are the tabernacle of God. We are the temple of God. His very presence lives within us. I don't have to go climb a mountain to find God. I don't have to go 
do a thousand days of work and fasting and praying to find God. The Bible says, let us enter into his courts and his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to God and get in his gate. But I don't want to get in the gate, do you? I don't want to stay in God's yard. He said, enter my courts with praise. That's why we sing, Rose mentioned that this morning. We sing and we worship because worship opens up the gates so that we can walk in and then go into his inner courts. The scripture I read in Hebrews said, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, but with all points tested just like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, come boldly into the throne room. That's his court. Come boldly into the throne room to find grace to help in time of need. Do you have a need today? You, you, you have an invitation from the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation, the only God who really is. You have an invitation to come boldly into his throne room, find grace to help in time of need. Let me tell you, he's on your side. He's for you. He knows you. He created you, and he wants you to have a blessed life. He wants to know you intimately more, but he wants you to know him intimately. He already knows you. He wants to fellowship with you. I want you to bow your head with me right now. If you're watching online, go ahead and just bow your head right there where you're watching. This is not limited to place or time. So if you watch this two weeks from now, it'll still work. Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's word is still powerful. The prayers that Jesus prayed, we're living in right now. Father, I pray right now over us, all this congregation, those watching online, I pray right now that you would give us a vision, an impartation of what it means to walk and to live and to come into your presence into your very throne room and have you give us grace to help in time of need. God, may we stop shunning you. May we stop being ashamed of all, maybe confess our sin and get it right and come boldly into your presence. Say, God, thank you that you not only forgive my sin, but you restore me to that righteousness that Paul talked about. You bring me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I have a right to come in there. I didn't earn it. I didn't discern it. Jesus paid the way for me. And I have a right. And I'm coming into your throne room saying, I want to know you better. I want to get to know you personally. I want to know you like I know my best friend. I want you to become my best friend so I can walk in your press, understand your ways. You want to do that today? You can. Right there where you are, just simply say, God, that's what I want. And mean it. You can't just say it with your head and with your mouth. You got to say it with your heart. I mean it, God. That's what I want. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that opens the door for you to do what we're talking about. If you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior today, this is the day to do it. It's a very simple process. The Bible says whoever commits, uh, asks for forgiveness for their sins they've committed, he'll forgive them and he'll come into their heart and be their Savior if you'll ask you'll just do that. Anyone need to do that today? Come on down right now. We're going to stand. Anyone need to come? Come on. I want to challenge you, leave you with this challenge. Don't let this message go in one ear and out the other. Let there be some substance inside there that holds on to this and says, that's what I want. Don't walk out of here and let the word of God that went forth be stolen from you before you get to the parking lot. Make it your word. Don't say I heard a message. Say I heard my message today. I believe God was speaking not only to me, but to you. I'm just the carrier and he leaves and deposits a lot with me as it goes out because I'm the first that has to let that word judge me. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not there yet, but I want to be. I want to know more. I want to experience more. I want to lay those things aside, those things that hinder, those things that beset, the chains that bind. I want to be totally free to experience 
my creator in the way he wants me to experience him. I challenge you to pray that prayer. God, let me, help me, show me how I can experience you in the way you want to, me to experience you. Show me anything that's hindering so that I can be perfectly right with you because that's what I want. That's what I want. If you're here today and you're a guest, we want to say thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Watching online, once again, we say thank you for watching online. We appreciate your comments. If you're here today, you're a guest and you uh, don't normally worship here, we'd love to meet you. Michelle and I are going to go over uh, to the uh, info center over in the new building. We'll be there waiting and come by and introduce yourself to us, if you would. The name of Jesus. One more time. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, and nothing compares to this. Beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. God, we just thank you this morning, Lord, for who you are. God, we thank you for this word. God, we ask you seal it in our hearts, Father. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, and for your faithfulness, Lord. We love you. We ask that you just bring us back safely next time. Protect us this week. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen. Come on, give him some praise if you're excited about Jesus today. Hey, merge and few students, don't forget we're having our friends giving tonight right here at the church. It's going to be fun. We'll see you there. Everybody have a great week.